Thank you very much. And of course, uh, the talk was described basically uh, when I got the invitation that I should give an inspirational talk, but it was not said what I should inspire. Is it hope or despair? And I do believe that, of course, despair is much easier these days. Uh, so, but I'll start with something which is quite obvious, uh, but in my view, it's important to be underlined. And this is, I don't know about the environment, but when it comes to politics in Europe, there is a climate change. Many things that have been basically taken for granted even five or ten years ago cannot be taken for granted anymore. Uh, for example, uh, Timothy Gardenash was saying that if he was frozen in 2005, he was going basically to go to rest as a happy European. If he was going to be unfrozen in 2017, he's going to die out of shock. And from this point of view, you really can see how much uh, for a very short period of time, uh, the perception about the world in which we are living has been uh, changed. If you go to the current affairs sections of a good bookstore today, uh, two of the uh, most best-selling, and by the way, very good books that you can decide to choose, one is called uh, How Democracies Dies, and the other is How Democracy Ends. Uh, uh, and uh, even, uh, even basically uh, what was reported uh, uh, was that when President Obama went out of the White, office, uh, White House office, the first question that he was asked was, what if we were wrong? Not what we did wrong, not what, what went wrong, but what if we were wrong? What about certain assumptions which were typical for the post-Cold War world? Uh, are not there. And I'm saying this because, particularly when it comes to the crisis of democracy, there are several things that I do believe we should take very seriously. Uh, there is now quite uh, uh, well-known data that, at present, we see a major decline within the Western liberal democracies in the trust of a democracy as a political system. We are not talking about the trust of governments. We are talking about the trust of a democracy as a political system. This kind of a mistrust is particularly high among the younger generation and particularly stronger in the United States. Secondly, which I do believe also we are seeing very much, is that the level of polarization that at least was not very well known uh, for the last 50 years is so much up that now in the United States, the number of uh, people coming from the Republican families who are ready to agree their son or daughter to make somebody on the Democratic side and the other way around is higher than the same percent between the Catholics and Protestants at the end of the 19th century. So basically, you basically have Democrats and Republicans coming as a two types of the subcultures and not simply a political uh, families. Also, what is changing incredibly and in a very short time is the way we see in technology and uh, we saw this basically mentioned in the previous speech, but if you remember during the Arab Spring, all this talk about the liberation technologies, all this fascination with the social media and how social media is going to become a major actor for democracy, if you're basically going to read the same newspapers that have been talking about liberation technologies today, then the question is, is Facebook going to break democracy? Is Google going to do it? In a certain way, the fear that the social media is making democracy much more difficult to function is something that is coming as a common space. And then we came the story that for the first time, and I do believe find this extremely serious, it's not simply that you have the crisis of democracy, but many people start to believe that with these major technological changes, authoritarian countries like China starts to have a competitive advantages towards democracy, particularly when it comes to artificial intelligence. Because artificial intelligence is not so much about creativity these days, but how easy you can collect data. And it appeared that for sure countries like China can collect data in the way no democratic country can do because of the privacy laws, but also because in our case it's much more the private corporations that are uh, doing this. I'm saying this because one of the major disadvantages cl classically of any authoritarian regime was that the more they try to have a social control and the more basically the governments try to know what people have in their mind, the more irrelevant basically the information that they get becomes. And uh, uh, German Democratic Republic is a great example of this. The bigger study was the political system starts to create a distortion of its own, so you know everything and at the end it appears that you don't know anything. This is not the same with the big data. 
big data is a different way of getting information in the authoritarian environment and also the possibility for the social control, the famous social scores of the Chinese government from this point of view as something that really should be taken serious and could be a game change. So why I'm saying all this? Because I do believe that this is quite important uh, to try to understand that probably some of the problems that we are facing are not the popular we are going back to the 1930s, but we are going to face a problem for which we have not been prepared because our expectations was the technological development, basically the globalization, is going to make the world much more open and democratic. And this closing came as a surprise. And I'm going to shift to Europe because if there was a place in which this climate change is, has the strongest negative effect paradoxically is Europe, it's even not the United States. For a very simple reason, the end of history was a book written by an American, but the end of history was the reality in European Union. All this belief in the post-national uh, uh, politics, all this idea that we are living in the future as the European Union and the world is going to be much more like us, this starts to be challenged and you can see this very much in the everyday life. And I'm going to talk about the three Europe's that are in crisis and then try to finish giving an idea probably also what uh, uh, probably we can do it about this. The first is the post-war Europe. And post-war Europe, I'm going to use post-war in two different senses. Europe was a post-war project, and Tony Judd has, this is a title of his famous history of Europe uh, in the last uh, uh, half of the, uh, uh, of the 20th century, because the memories of the World War II were extremely strong. They have keeping European Union together, and it was not by accident that all the founding me members of the European Union were the country that had been defeated in the war. But this type of a memories, for very kind of uh, understandable reasons, does not have the same power today. For many of the people of the younger generation, World War II is such an ancient story like basically the Peloponnesians wars. There was a study being done in German schools that shows that one third of the uh, uh, children believe that, uh, that human rights were well protected uh, during the Nazi regime. And this is not because they have any sympathy for Hitler, but simply they don't remember how it was. It's not part of it. And uh, historians and psychologists were very well showing that the third generation is the generation in which you start to forget. Uh, and particularly keeping in mind that also the educational system is changing and people are getting much more information from internet and other stories. Uh, this type of a European as a post-war project in which you are going basically to keep uh, uh, the identity of the Union basically on the shared memories of the war is something that cannot be taken for granted. Paradoxically also, the fact that you have many more non-Europeans living in Europe these days is also a factor in this. It's very difficult to convince the Syrians that the war that should shape their imagination is going to be the World War II. For them, war is a different war. And the European war of the 20th century is not basically what is at their stake. But post-war was for Europe also quite important because Europeans, we managed to convince us that we are living on a continent, probably not in the world, but in which the war was not possible anymore. So from this point of view, all the idea of Europe that everything is about economy, everything is about soft power, that military power does not have sense anymore when you're talking about the European Union, this is not the way it works after the annexation of Crimea, after many things that is happening, and also at the moment in which American security guarantees cannot be taken for granted in the way they have been taken before. So for the certain type of our understanding that the war was not possible here anymore is not something uh, that looks uh, uh, credible today. The second Europe, which in my view is very much going to crisis, and this is the Europe which you know very well, is what I'm going to call post-1968 Europe, the Europe of rights. Uh, because if uh, the human rights and the documents created with the human rights were typical also for the post-war uh, uh, period after 1945. It was 1968 and the change of sensibility of societies, a shift of collective imagination that made the individual rights, the rights of the minority so central for the way the European Union is functioning. To a certain extent, it was also a generational revolution. There was a certain generation that came to power for which the sensitivity about rights was critically important. By the way, even today, if you go on the public opinion polls, you're going to see that the generation 
that pays most attention to rights is not the younger generation, but still basically is the baby boomer generation, people who are now in their uh, 60s. Uh, and I find this quite important because on this field, one important change came, and this is if till yesterday, when we talk rights, most of the time we're talking about the rights of minorities. What you see with the major populist wave that you see all over Europe, what came at the center of the discourse is the rights of the majorities. You have a new actor, and this is the threatened majorities. For demographic and other reasons, you have an ethnic groups, which basically, nevertheless, that they are majority in their countries, they start to behave as a persecuted minorities, and who basically believes that they are the biggest victim of what is happening. And I do believe from this point of view, migration is, and this is what was, was my major argument also in the book after Europe, this is the crisis that is very much going to define the European Union, not because of the number of the people coming. Uh, by the way, the number of the people that came to the European Union after the war in Syria is negligible comparing with the size of the continent and also basically even seeing how many people have been received in places like Turkey or Jordan and others. But it was this crisis that forced Europeans to see the world with different eyes and to discover something which in my view is uh, in a way very important. People discovered that migration is the revolution of the 21st century. But it's a very different than the revolution of the 20th century that have ideologies that basically have this and that. Because what people discovered is today, if you want to change your life radically, better change the country than try to change the government. And people can much easier do it. And when they started who belongs and who does not belongs become a major, uh, a major political problem. And uh, the third crisis which we see is the crisis of the post-1989 Europe, the East-West divide in my view is very quite clear, and here, because the time is running, I just want to make two points about uh, 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 the East European uh, case. In Eastern Europe, migration is not so much about the fear of the people coming. In Eastern Europe, it's very much the trauma of the people that have left for the last 30 years. What people don't realize is the major political impact of the depopulation of Central and Eastern Europe. Just give you one example. Just in the last 10 years, 3.4 million Romanians have left the country. Three-fourths of them are younger than 35. So you are seeing aging and shrinking society, which developed a demographic panic, starting to believe that probably in 100 years nobody is going to live there anymore. So if the classical kind of a view and picture that you have uh, on the migrant side is a lot of young kids who cannot go in school, what is typical for Eastern Europe is quite beautiful playgrounds for kids built, built with European money, but there is nobody to play on them. And this is particularly strong in some countries. Countries, for example, like my own country, Bulgaria, lost more than 23% of their population for the last 30 years. And according to the demographic projections, we're going to lose 20% more in the next 30 years. So this is a major story. And the second story is that while Central and Eastern Europe have been quite successful uh, imitating the Western models, at some point you became resentful to things that you imitate because of having the feeling that you imitated your second class citizen and even your success does not belong to you. And some of this kind of a populist parties, they really made anti-imitation. We don't want to imitate the Germans anymore. We don't want to imitate French anymore uh, as the major point. So in the one minute's left, where I do believe uh, what is critically important, particularly for people like you in this situation. And my major argument is that in situations like this, people try to generalize. They try to see the things happening in every country as the same story. And my message is, get much more in the specific and nuance. People like to talk about Hungary and Poland. Listen, both regimes have a very clear illiberal trends, but they are very different. For example, Hungarian regime is quite corrupt. It's, it's a public secret how money has been used. Mr. Kaczynski is not about money. In Hungary, you have a total control over the media space. Poland is much more like the United States, it's a divided country. I'm saying this because in a certain way, and this is the last moment because I have 20 seconds to end on this, normally, the human rights people, for good reasons, 
he's been proud of trying to be non-political. You're staying for a norm, you're not interested kind of in the political context and the political implication. But I do believe with the climate change, it's time even for you to get political. Thank you very much.